This is Leadership in Action, and I'm Mark Stiles, your host. Join me as we delve deep into the passions, expertise, and experiences of Boston area innovators. Sponsored by the Boston Chapter of Entrepreneurs Organization, this is Leadership in Action. Hey, folks, welcome back to another episode of Leadership in Action, your Boston Chapter of EO's podcast. Today's guest has 25 years plus logged into the communications, finance, and sustainability world. He's been a member with EO here in Boston for 12 years loves to build and help others build things. He's a strategic communication specialist. He's also the impact chair here on your board of the Boston chapter of EO. He's the president and owner of Longview Strategies. Please meet Evan Zoll. What's up, Evan? Hello. That is all true, even the 25 years part, which... I embrace with uh, open arms. Which if you're watching this, he doesn't look like he could possibly have started working 25 years ago unless he's Doogie Howser sustainability Come on guy. now. Huh? <laughs> All right, here we go. You ready? What's the most positive lesson you've learned while running a business? Yeah, so long time, long time, those, those, most of those 25 years running a business. Um, this too shall pass. That is the one that that um, has taken me the longest to learn. I think what it really means, the good and the bad, it all just, everything just sort of keeps going. And when, when things are going fantastic, it will change. That doesn't mean it's going to crater, but it will change. And when things are, are feeling at the bottom, that too is going to change. And it's this sort of notion of impermanence that, again, has taken me sort of decades to come around to, uh, and I would say it's really, it's just really present for me because it's something I struggled with. I'm an emotional guy. I'm okay. an emotional entrepreneur and the ups and downs, man, they, they, I, I have rolled with the ups and downs, very, uh, very roller coaster like, and, uh, something just sort of clicked in, in recent weeks and just even keel. That's awesome. And can I share something with you? I, Please do. I, I don't think you're alone. No, I think no, I don't all think so. are rowing that same boat in entrepreneur land. And yeah. I get it, right? This too shall pass. I mean, I heard that as a kid. I heard that as an adult. And it really, it's, uh, it's something that takes a lot of introspection to really believe, especially when it's on the downside of something and yeah. you don't feel like it's going to pass. Right. And then on the flip side, the wave, right? We always talk about it as you're riding the wave, right? You're on the up. Now stay on the wave as long as you possibly can. Definitely. Stay on that wave. Sometimes you forget that that wave might crash. And crash is such a terrible word. I don't want to use right. crash, but you know, that wave won't roll. It will subside. It will, it subside. will ease. It will change. Yeah. I liked how you said that. It will change, right? This too shall pass. Doesn't necessarily mean it's an on-off switch, right? Right. It's a journey. And I'll, and I'll tell you, if, if I can't, can I, can I go a little further with of course. Uh, sort of the, the realization? Because again, like you said, I've heard this all my life, but what has it really meant to me? Mm -hmm. there, were, there were words that I thought I understood. But um, there is a time, and I won't, I won't pin an, an exact time on it, but a, uh, I, we, were, we were in one of those troughs. We were in a business trough, and one of my EO peers actually um, noted to me as I was talking about the trough and lack of revenue, and I was, I was pretty down about it. And um, I was like, I, you know, how, what am I, I going to do? Like, what's, what's wrong with this, with, the, with this picture? And he said, you know, we've heard this from you before. I've known him a long time. So we've heard this from you before in is my this initial, forum? yeah, yeah, this was an informal. Cool. Um, and my initial reaction was, well, sh well, you, you've heard it from me before because, you know, my business, this is, this is just what happens in my business and it, and it sucks. And then it just like triggered something. And I realized it's, wait, it's not the business. It's my reaction to what's happening. My business is in a totally different place at this particular moment during this conversation, my, my, 
my business is in a totally different place than the last time this happened and the time it happened before and the time it happened before. I mean, a couple of decades, it happens a lot. You have those, these ups and downs. And I realized that it was, it was my response to the situation, and not the actual situation, and that the actual situation will resolve. And I just have to do my thing and be patient and trust in the plan. It's enlightening, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good moment. Yeah. Congratulations. Testament to forum as well. Yeah. So not jumping uh, too far down the agenda line, but one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, you know, what, what have you gotten from EO? And it sounds mm. like you've gotten a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, over the years, I mean, I used to say that that forum in particular had a major impact on my business once a year, essentially. Interesting. Um, in some fashion or another, and whether that is the way that I handle my business and the sort of 360 nature of being an entrepreneur or whether it impacts the, the business significantly, a, ma a major impact once a year. Um, Forum's been the key uh, for me, but also obviously the, the full network of EO. You know, I had a, another sort of transformative entrepreneurship experience going to GLC. This was, this was a while ago, but going to GLC in Panama, um, that was eye-opening to be with entrepreneurial leaders from the entire hemisphere. Uh, those, those types of things, I mean, it's, it's gold. It's helped me grow. So sh paint the picture of Panama. So you were on the board. So you were invited to the global leadership is it council? Is that what the C stands for? A committee or something with a C? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I just call it GLC. Get off my we'll back. We'll fact check that later, oh. folks. Um, and you arrive in Panama. So, so tell me what that was like. Uh, well, it was not a place I had been before. So yeah. it, was, it was cool to be there. And you're with a bunch of... Uh, with a bunch of great, very motivated people who not only want to share their stories and talk about their businesses, but also about the, um, the organization itself and explore the city, uh, learn things about the city. We had the president of Panama speak to the group. Um, he was certainly very welcoming and interested to share uh, how the economy works what the opportunities are for entrepreneurs that might want to do business in Panama. There was a tour of the Panama Canal. There's, I mean, all, all of these fantastic sort of, again, eye-opening opportunities and experiences packed into a weekend. And one of the big things that I, I took away from it is, you know, we all suffer from imposter syndrome. Mm. Right. That's, that's, that's not just me either. Maybe a, a little bit less as I, as I gain in these years, but, uh, I, you know, my, I don't run a, uh, the biggest business in, in EO. I, I, I love that. Um, because I, I feel the same way, right. Am I an entrepreneur, you know, is my business that, you know, it's a sa it's not a SaaS product, so yeah. I'm not an entrepreneur <laughs> yet, you know, it's, it's a mindset, you know, and to find that community like you found here at EO is it's like a light goes on and you're like, okay, I'm not alone. Right. Yeah. So, Absolutely. well, let me segue into your business a, a little bit. Um, long view strategies, mm -hmm. right? Not a high growth business, but there it is. There it is for those watching. Uh, this podcast, uh, we had a little swag, a little sip of the swag cup there. Um, what exactly does Longview Strategies do? Great question. Thank you for, for asking that. I didn't expect that. Um, well, we are a, a marketing and communications firm. We're focused on the intersection of communications, finance, and sustainability. When I originally launched the firm, the mission, and still the mission, is to help drive capital into sustainability using the skill sets that we have. So we do a lot of traditional communications work for clients that are um, either that are focused on sustainability or have some kind of financial instrument that's focused on sustainability, private equity, venture capital, investment managers. Uh, and then we have another segment of the 
business that's focused on environmental, social, and governance for corporates, helping them to sort of assess their impact um, and sort of how they are managing risk in managing environmental, social, and governance risk, doing that on the technical side, and then helping to tell that story. So your client is the actual corporation that wants to present a, a um, compliant, if you will, for lack of a better term, yep. ESG company, right? So that becomes yep. a company that a money manager would invest in when they're directed to invest in only or a segment of or a fund of ESG compliant companies. Uh, yes, that's that's one big part of it. So public companies need to need to have their uh, their ship in order for mm -hmm. analysts to be able to assess whether they've got the whether their ESG is strong enough for them to invest in if that's something that is on their radar and that is more and more the case. Uh, but we also see private companies do it and we see private equity do it for their portfolios. Uh, VC is starting to do it more and more. So what are the, what are, you know, best practices of a company to show that they are ESG uh, compliant, approved, right. certified, whatever the, the, the tag may be? Yeah. So to do it right, there is a process that you go through and it, it it's more than people think. It's, it's daunting. And, and I'll come back to that in a second, but it involves things like measuring carbon emissions and setting a goal for how you're going to reduce that. And, you know, the goals can range all over the, all over the place. The important thing is that you're aware of what is happening and you're setting a goal. That's the most straightforward piece, I think. That's the piece that most understand. But there's also a, a tranche of, you know, you need the right policies in place. You need to be clear about you know, you may assume everybody believes that you do not support human trafficking, but you also need for the analyst community a document that says what your human trafficking policy is and your environmental policy and your your um, general risk policies. Um, that's another piece of it. Uh, DE&I, workforce treatment, human, human capital management, that's another piece of it. There are all these interlocking pieces and there is a process to go through. It's a very defined process to figure out what's important to your business and what you need to focus on because you don't actually need to focus on everything. You need to focus on certain things that are most important and as we say, material to your business. But the, let's take an organization like BlackRock and they say, we're only going to invest funds in ESG companies uh, for this fund or for this subset of investors or whatever it may be. But we, who actually certifies them? Who is there? Mm -hmm. There's, there's policies and procedures, you know, it's, is it self-reported? Is there a no. overseeing body that, that kind of analyzes uh, whether the boxes are being checked properly? Yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's a big mess. I'll be perfectly honest. It's this whole evolving system of frameworks mm. and standards that is not universal. Um, there are things like uh, SASB, which is now ISSB, which I think is the International Sustainability Standards Board. There's GRI, which is the Global Reporting Initiative. Um, there's several of these different frameworks that you would report to. And there, the holy grail was to make this all one, to standardize yeah. all this. But it's looking more and more like maybe that's not going to happen because businesses are different. They're in different sectors. And just as you may report on your financials a little bit differently in different cases, um, you should be able to report on ESG differently in different cases, but that's, that's all evolving for sure. That's interesting. And you're on the forefront of it. So again, rewinding the tape. So you're helping promote this for companies to help them, uh, shine the light on what they're doing in that space. Yeah. So there are two aspects to the business. That's one of them. One of them is helping them get the ship in order and then okay. helping them report on it and communicate about it. Okay. And the other side of the business is a little more straight up marketing and communications for firms 
that do have you know, that might have climate technology or might be an investment firm that focuses on socially responsible investing or, or something something along those lines where we are where their marketing firm where their marketing and communications outsource solution got it got it so that's really interesting and you know i i say this a lot on this podcast you know, I go to these events and I meet people and I'm like, Evan, really good guy. I have no idea what he does. Now I do. And and thank you for sharing that. But also thank you for volunteering your time on the board. Can we talk about that a little bit? What's your role and what are you doing? And yeah, and, uh, what do a, you visualize? Because I think this is a new role as well, right? It It's a it's a new old role. So it came and it went, I think, through COVID. And I'm not exactly sure what happened there. But, but well, I'm rebooting it in, in the local chapter. And just to, to tie together a really nice segue, the reason that this is the focus of my company is I wanted to position us around the, around the, sustainable, the sustainability ball, basically, right, cover all sides. Um, so that's why we have these different practices. And I was inspired to do that a while ago because I saw that the link between profitability and sustainability has to be there. Companies, there used to be this philosophy that basically making an impact or focusing on sustainability was akin to charity. And that means that your business isn't really focused on the bottom line. That's, you hear that a lot with the Still. pushback against ESG. Yep. Um, but the truth is that they are interconnected. And if you're, if you do it right, then your business makes an impact while you make the same amount of profits that you would make anyway. And there's a significant camp that believes you can be more profitable by focusing on sustainability because we're in a changing world and these are important themes. So the impact share, um, in terms of EO is really driving home the notion that as businesses, we have an impact in our individual businesses, whether we know it or not, whether it's intentional or not, um, we have an impact. And, and my goal is for us to make it more intentional. So that can be, we have an impact like my, my, my business is built around it. So our, our impact is part of the service we are helping we are we are using our skills to make the world a better place that there really is what we're trying to do but it may not be that as straightforward you may run a business that where the product or service has nothing to do with that but you're still impacting your employees and you're still impacting your vendors and you're still impacting the community around you so being intentional about the way you go about that is should be inherent in how we run our businesses and as EO begins to sort of uh, embrace this, and, and we will all embrace this eventually, um, we're going to see cumulatively that the impact that the chapter has, that all of our businesses have, and the Northeast and the, the national um, EO, I, I mean, the cumulative impact is significant. Small businesses make up a big part of this economy. And if we're all aware of the impact that we're having, we can measure that. And we can feel pretty good about not just the money we make, but also the impact that we're having. So what are you hoping to accomplish in this role as impact chair in our Boston chapter of EO? Like, what are you, what are you, what are you hoping, what, what impact are you hoping to have as the impact chair? Uh, Long-term, okay. it would be to measure that cumulative impact short-term. There's definitely a lot of education. Not everyone mm -hmm. thinks this way. Not everybody understands or believes in the connection. But I believe that as we continue to educate, people will, will see that the connection is there. Um, and then being able to aggregate what we're all doing and tell that story first at the chapter level. But I've already been in touch with people in other chapters that think the same way. So if we can start to spread this out in the Northeast, again, that's, that is the vision is to, to sort of show the world the impact that EO businesses have. Evan, how much of this, um, how much of the resistance, if you will, uh, to the open mind to ESG and all of what it is, is, is kind of a political 
conversation that you have to overcome. Well, more recently, <laughs> it didn't used to be a political conversation. It used to be just an economic conversation. Um, it's interesting on the, on the corporate side, it's not very present on the investment side. It has been more present and you've seen a pullback. I mean, going into, uh, 2022, there is more and more momentum around putting money into sustainability, into ESG. It was, um, we were hitting a tipping point with that. And the political backlash did a really good job of tamping that down for a while. It's starting to come back to where it was, but it has definitely disrupted the, the conversation in a big way. On the corporate side, they have to do, lar large companies have to do this. Public companies have to do this. Anybody who is doing business in Europe has to do this because Europe is mandated. Uh, European companies are, are mandated. Are they doing a good job that it's something that we would want to model? Um, it's, it's pretty messy. And that's what one of the big, this is a whole other conversation, but ESG was essentially thrust into the spotlight before it was cooked. It's not done. Yes. So understood. there's still more evolution to it. So they're doing an okay job, but they just made an announcement. They're just delaying, uh, some of the requirements they're kicking in the can on a few requirements, but, um, companies have to report on, um, how they're measuring risk on ESG to their company and their impact outside the company in terms of ESG. And there's one of the, the things that they need to do is look at their supply chain. So if you're in the supply chain ah. of a European company, then this is going to come to you. And this is what we see all the time. It's actually a fairly big driver of that side of the business is they're getting RFPs, uh, especially mid-market companies are getting RFPs from European customers and they don't know how to respond to them. They're getting questions about ESG and they have nothing in place whatsoever. And uh, they've already, we've already heard anecdotally of um, some business losses, some losses um, that are associated with, they just can't, they can't fill out the RFP. And that's going to happen more and more. And that's one of the reasons we focus on mid-market companies because large multinational companies, they have, they go to EY, they go to Deloitte, um, they can, they're going to just buy the whole thing, just do the whole thing. Um, mid-market companies for the most part are stuck, uh, and a little bit lost in terms of where to begin. And they're, they're not going to, um, devote the same kind of investment to a Deloitte or an EY to figure it out. So there you are solving the problem. Leading the way. That's what we say. I love it. I love it. So with those mid markets, you know, how daunting is this? Like, is it, um, is there a standardized way of, of, um, you know, systematizing this, this process or is each company so specific and unique that it requires almost a full-time employee to make sure that it's staying compliant? Um, it should be, it can be systematized. It should be systematized in terms of mid markets who are just starting out. It's definitely not. And it's, uh, everyone's in the same boat and it's, it's not their fault. You, you haven't been tracking carbon right. emissions. You don't, you don't have all the information. So going out there and getting the data is a whole process. Usually, um, at a lot of mid market and, and definitely even a little bit smaller, there is someone appointed to handle this. They might be a VP of operations. They might be the general counsel, but it's not their job to figure out the, the ESG equation. It's something that just has to be done. It will grow into a job um, once things get settled, but most, a lot of companies are starting with, with nobody to handle it, basically. So are these huge opportunities for other folks to jump into that process and I do carbon emissions uh, calculations. I do yes. this. And yeah, are you seeing totally. that? Totally. There's uh, a lot of providers. A lot of them are highly qualified. A lot of them are not. A lot of people are just throwing their yeah. hat in there. <laughs> um, and, you know, the 
Good news is, so my advice to any mid-markets who are in this, who are listening are to- Call Evan. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're always happy to have a conversation about what questions to ask. Yeah. Um, And we we do a lot of that. Just make sure you're educated about what exactly it is you're looking for from your team that you're assembling and what the real needs are. The other thing we see a lot of is trying to piecemeal it. I'd mentioned the RFPs. So- Oh, I had this RFP I mentioned. Can you just write this specific response to the RFP or we need this one policy in place? Really, honestly, the best thing to do is step back and say, what am I going to need over the next two years to really, as we say, respond, not react. Think yeah. it through, put it together. Um, it is daunting. It, there's, there's no question. It's, it's a one, new business function. But present day, if you have set it up properly, then you're in a great spot to attract those RFPs that otherwise other companies in your space might not be ready to execute on. Correct. Attracting attracting RFPs, being able to respond faster, attracting mm-hmm. capital, if you're trying to attract capital, Attracting employees. This is a big piece of this, especially mm. we, you know, we talk a lot about millennials and Gen Z um, as as big drivers of sustainability and ESG. And it is true they care who who they work for, <laughs> and they want it to be authentic. They want it to be transparent. Um, it is a a, rec- a point of strength for recruiting when you have this um, this all put together. Hmm. And you help coordinate and have you met and feel comfortable referring the carbon calculator and the DEI uh, evaluator or? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. And I find it fascinating when I talk with other EO members on this podcast, because there's worlds out there that I simply am not aware, (laughs) you know, and there's opportunities everywhere. For folks yeah, who and, are passionate. And we live in this bubble. Uh, my team lives in this bubble and we we forget that not everyone is as entrenched in this. I'm always surprised when I, ta- I talked to somebody a couple of weeks ago and I mentioned ESG and they said, well, wait, what is ESG? And I was like, oh, right. Because I'm like living this every day. Yeah. It's an actually a, an everyday thing. Um, but it is important um, and it's it's getting more important for mid-markets and it will eventually be important to small companies as, as well. In in essence, it's going to be mandated at some point, right? Yeah. I mean, there's always thresholds, but uh, mid-markets are going to have a tough time doing business. With eventually. anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know, change is tough, right? It is. It can be painful. Um, and I'll, I did want to throw out there, there are plenty of companies that do tackle this proactively because they want to be more sustainable. Mm-hmm. We have clients like that and we love working with both types of clients because there's so much value to those who right, where, where making, a, making an impact is part of their DNA. And this is another way to formalize it. And they're excited about it and they have processes in place. And then there are the companies that are sort of being f- forced into it um, in a sense, but that's just as important because by learning about it, by us helping to educate them and walk them through the process, and they will, they will see the value of this being baked into the company. And that, I mean, it's, it's so cheesy, but it makes the world a better place. And I do, I get, I get pushback on that where there are some entrenched sustainability advocates that believe that those who are being, those who are doing it because it's required to doing it, that there's less value to that. And it, it almost sort of doesn't count. And I couldn't disagree more. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, that's how change happens, right? You get dragged kicking and screaming, but then you're, you're better for it. Amen. And those that may be kicking and screaming realize you're right. There's bottom line value to this. Definitely. Are the, is anyone tracking that? Uh, yeah, I mean, the numbers are all over the place. It's a young industry, but you talk about, again, you, if you think about DE&I as an example, yep. there are two obvious examples. DE&I, um, you can be exposed to lawsuits. You can lose people. 
uh, this was a big issue in the in big tech where um, there were a couple of companies that weren't able to retain staff and the cost of turnover is high. It really impacts the bottom line. The other piece of it is managing but that's culture. Risk. That's culture at that point, right? Um, it's culture. There is legal exposure. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's entrenched culture of, of making sure that no matter the, no matter your background, you have the opportunity to excel yeah. at, at a company and you're given the tools that you need in order to do that. Um, and uh, climate risk is the other huge one that is really easy to point to. If you're not, if you're not tracking and measuring how you're going to respond to extreme weather events, flood risk, I mean, it couldn't be more obvious, right? You're jeopardizing your business. And if you are using water irresponsibly in the, on the, uh, out, out West, you're jeopardizing the water supply for others and you're going to run dry yourself. So being able to measure this stuff and put numbers to the risk, investors look at those things. If you're a food and beverage manufacturer in a, in a drought, um, in an area that's susceptible to drought and you're not thinking about how you're using water, that's a big risk. That's interesting. That's really interesting. So when you're not helping folks with their business, when you're not helping our members uh, raise awareness around this and help impact and make the world a better place, and I don't think that's cliche or cheesy. I think that's mission oriented and and profound. Um, what are you doing? What are you doing for fun? What are you, uh, well, hobbies and such? Yeah. So we're a big music family. I have, uh, I have two boys. They're both very talented musically. Um, my wife, who is also my business partner, um, she, and we didn't talk about that at all, but we could, no. we could get into that too. Um, she and I are both musical. So we spend, we spend a lot of time around music. There's a lot of, um, original music and sort of jamming that, that goes on. So that's, that's a big part of the extracurricular. Very cool. The Partridge family. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had those moments. Absolutely. What instruments do we have, uh, assembled in this, in this band of um, our family? So, well, well, we've got my oldest plays. He, his main instrument is the guitar. He's a great singer. He also plays a little bit of drums and a little bit cool. of bass. My younger is a very well self-taught uh, keyboardist who is an amazing. So they're both amazing songwriters. He's got a real gift for putting songs together. Cool. Um, and my wife's a big singer. I play the guitar get us all together in the basement, which is the music room. And it is indeed the Partridge family. I love it. I love it. I can visualize it. I can see the memories. I, I love every, every second of it. This has been really wonderful getting to know you, Evan. I mean, I, I, I met you, I knew you peripherally. Now I, I really feel like I have a, a much deeper understanding and, and relationship with you. So yeah, thank you same, for that. Same to you. Same to you. This has been great. So when folks listen to this and, uh, and then they get to know you a little bit better and they're going to see you in, in a different light, hopefully. However, what I'd like to do is ask you to let folks know how to connect with you. Sure. I mean, I think the easiest way is just LinkedIn. I, I am on there a lot. So Evan's all on LinkedIn. Look me up. Connect with them. Engage yes. with them. And Please you can do. see how uh engaging he is so um do that and uh when you see him let's talk sustainability i mean let's make the world a better place why not? why not we're here why not i love it well thank you so much evan it was it was really wonderful chatting with you and uh i learned a lot and i hope uh i hope the folks that were listening learned a lot as well me too thanks a lot it's been fun well, folks, it's been another exciting episode of Leadership in Action. I hope you learned something as well today, or maybe you thought about somebody. And if you did, please forward this and share it with them. In fact, share it with anyone. Thank you all very much. We will see you next time.
Thanks again, Evan. Thank you. Leadership in Action is sponsored by the Boston chapter of the Entrepreneurs' Organization. As the world's only peer-to-peer network exclusively for entrepreneurs, EO helps transform the lives of those who transform the world.